tonight on NJ Spotlight News. Defying the governor, state Democratic leaders siding with Republicans on hot button issues like offshore wind and parental rights. We're trying to drive the Democrat party back to the middle. I think we're being successful in that because both the Senate president and the speaker have now come out against this policy. Plus, no bribes allowed. Political candidates can now be charged with bribery even if they don't win an election. Also, a full rebrand. Bye-bye to Seaside Heights' party town reputation. The mayor turning once popular nightclubs into family-friendly destinations. We want you to come down. Bring your partner, your spouse, your friends. Dance, drink. But understand, we don't want fights. This is not a nightclub atmosphere. And chasing the dream. A Trenton housing program is restoring abandoned properties, creating pathways for lower income families to buy their own homes. I didn't want to spend a penny more renting. I wanted to own something and I wanted to leave something behind to my children and my family. NJ Spotlight News begins right now. Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term sustainable clean energy future for New Jersey. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us on this Tuesday night. I'm Brianna Venosi. In a rare political move, New Jersey's top Democratic lawmakers are breaking with the Murphy administration. Assembly Speaker Craig Coughlin and Senate President Nick Scutari are joining the course of Republicans in criticizing the state's approach to offshore wind projects and new rules around gender identity in public schools. Their surprising comments come at a time when so-called culture war topics are taking center stage in towns across the state and as all 120 legislators are on the ballot this fall. Senior political correspondent David Cruz reports. Through much of the first six years of the Murphy administration, Democrats in the legislature have supported and enabled the governor's progressive agenda, with few exceptions, including issues like gender and equity and offshore wind. But now, as they approach elections in the fall, Democrats are finding, through internal polling or just simply while out there campaigning, that the policies they backed are now getting pushback from some of the state's more conservative voters. Republicans know this. I think this administration has taken a hard left. And I think uh, the Democrat Party and the leaders in both houses have supported that hard left. Senator Bucco is pushing a bill to overturn the recent State Board of Ed updates to policies on equity, which included updates to language that substitutes gender identity for gender and favors the term equity over equality. No matter that the rules, such as they are, don't require local districts to do anything like allowing boys to play on girls' sports teams, the contentious vote and reaction to it prompted a rare response from the Assembly Speaker and Senate President. Though the State Board of Education sets guidelines on curriculum, says the joint statement, it is our local communities through their elected boards of education that decide on the final lesson plans. I think they are absolutely concerned about the extreme agenda that has been coming out of the Murphy administration and that they have been supportive of uh, throughout this entire last term um, before that. Um, now, all of a sudden, we're in an election year and they're getting worried, and they should be, because parents are upset. I think to some extent, David, the die has been cast since the close governor's race in 2021. 
the takeaway that legislative leaders took from that election was be extra cautious on everything. Don't defend anything that's controversial, even things that you've had a hand in. Only be unapologetic about affordability. Including lately the potential cost of electrifying the state with the help of offshore wind, as Democrats have been championing. When the BPU opened the application window for more offshore wind projects recently, the anti-wind crowd bellowed. And for the second time in two weeks, Democrats blinked. Kind of. A second joint statement says, quote, there are still many unanswered questions about the economic impact these projects will have on ratepayers, as well as potential impacts on one of our state's largest economic drivers, tourism at the shore. See what they did there? Longtime environmental activist Jeff Tittle says Democrats are trying to play both sides to their own potential detriment. And when they see them being wishy-washy or kowtowing to special interests, they, they get turned off. And this is going to be an off-year election, and that means that the, it's about the base coming out. Neither the Speaker nor the Senate President was available to talk to us about this today, so it's tough to say what motivated their recent statements. Maybe it's pushback against the governor who's not on the ballot in the fall, and maybe it's Republican footsteps, which they're just now starting to hear more clearly. I'm David Cruz. NJ Spotlight News. Meanwhile, a former assemblyman is back on trial after the state Supreme Court on Monday ruled that bribery is illegal no matter how you try to frame it. In a unanimous decision, the court ruled New Jersey candidates can be charged with accepting a bribe even if they lose an election. The case involved Jason O'Donnell, a former Hudson County lawmaker and one-time Bayonne mayoral candidate, who was charged with accepting cash for the promise to give someone a city job had he won the mayor's seat. Senior writer Colleen O'Day has been following the case and joins me to explain. Colleen, it's good to talk to you um, because this is a really interesting case. So talk to me first about the implications here for the former assemblyman. So now that this case goes back to court, I mean, he faces some pretty stiff penalties. You know, bribery is a very serious offense. And uh, that was why his lawyers had argued that, you know, by not having been elected, he shouldn't face bribery charges. What was the case being made as to why this didn't have legs? Uh, simply the fact that he didn't hold the office uh, he was running for, in which the bribe was promised? Right, right. And, you know, the, the Supreme Court and its decision seemed to dismiss that pretty quickly in terms of saying, you know, it, it seems just like common sense to say that whether or not you win the office, the bribe was placed and the promise was there so that the intention was to, to carry it forward. Um, so that, yeah, you know, uh, the gentleman who was working with prosecutors uh, had offered the $10,000 and uh, wanted to be essentially the tax lawyer for the city. And this was something that, that O'Donnell agreed to. And so, you know, it seemed fairly clear cut, at least it, it seems, from the reading of the Supreme Court decision. And yet it almost didn't come this far. A superior court ruling um, had rejected this entire notion, which uh, was very surprising at the time. Yeah, and that actually had um, some implications for legislation. After that judge's ruling, lawmakers moved pretty quickly to pass a bill that would very specifically say, um, you know, candidates can be convicted of bribery even if they aren't eventually elected. Um, that bill went to the governor. He conditionally vetoed it because of some technicalities. He wanted some changes in language. And interestingly, uh, that still hasn't passed. The Assembly agreed to the conditional veto. The Senate didn't. Um, it may not need to do that now because we've got this established case law from the Supreme Court. So now uh, this former state lawmaker, Jason O'Donnell, who held that office uh, in the assembly for five years, he will stand trial. Give us a little primer on what this is going to look like and how this case may or may not have a role in it. 
Yeah, so he's going to stand trial. It's, it goes back to the trial court for a full hearing. Um, I'm not sure what kind of defense he's going to have, according to um, what we understand. There is video evidence and there's audio evidence of him accepting the the ten thousand dollars in, by the way, a Baskin Robbins paper bag, which kind of made it another interesting uh, piece of New Jersey. Uh, Pretty classic. Yeah, it, it trends legend, for sure. Or lore, yeah. Right. Um, and, and so he's he's both on audio and video, um, supposedly, allegedly agreeing to this exchange, ten thousand dollars for this tax job. I think it's you know, it's certainly going to be um, his lawyers are going to have their work cut out. Right. for him. Yeah. And of course, this will have implications uh, for future cases. Uh, Colleen O'Day for us. Thank you so much, Kyle. Thank you. For more of Colleen's reporting on the state Supreme Court's decision and what it means for other bribery cases, head to njspotlightnews.org. Well, the push to expand commuter rail service to Sussex County is still on. Congressman Josh Gottheimer led a group of rail officials to Andover yesterday, where work is underway to build a new train station that will be served by New Jersey Transit's restoration of the Lackawanna Cutoff. It's a rail line that was built in the early 1900s, part of a main line between Hoboken and Buffalo, New York. The restoration is expected to be done in 2026 and could eventually be part of a new Amtrak service connecting New York City to Scranton. Well, the route is projected to generate about $80 million in economic activity each year, a big reason why Amtrak selected it as a candidate to study. If approved, Amtrak officials say that service to Scranton could begin as soon as 2028. We've been working for years to get a, a train stop here and to get Amtrak to run all the way from New York up to Pennsylvania through this area. Unbelievable big help for commuters who come from here to New York every day. You're talking about 40,000 people every single day, and this is the highest, longest commute times in the state is in this area. So it will give people huge relief. They get to hop on a train, get to work and commute. More than 1,700 nurses at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital in New Brunswick are on strike for a fifth day. They walked off the job Friday after contract negotiations between the hospital and the nurses union stalled. Staffing levels and increased paid sick days remain the sticking point between both sides. The nurses say depleted staffing levels are creating dangerous conditions for patients and causing burnout for workers. Robert Wood Johnson Health an underwriter of NJ Spotlight News has maintained that the medical facility remains open, fully operational, and completely staffed, thanks to replacement nurses. Judy Danella is president of the Nurses Union. She says passion on the picket line is at an all-time high. She joins me now. Judy, thanks for taking some time today. Let me start first with an update on negotiations. Where do things stand? Right now, we're supposed to, the mediator called us back. We are supposed to meet tomorrow morning with the hospital for the mediator's request. What's inside, though, the latest offer from the hospital? Can you share any details? Well, the second proposal that they had given out pretty much mirrors the first with a minor little change with the on-call. But everything else was pretty much the same as the one that the members rejected, 75%. And so list for us what that includes. That includes um, the safe staffing, but with the caveats of if somebody calls out sick, they would, the penalty wouldn't be attached. And with the core deficit that still remained in there, you still wanted that to be removed. Um, they did do the on-call. They made it $6 plus time and a half. And the caps of the insurance, they wanted zero, eight, and eight. We still want to move it down because it's a self-insured plan that we feel they can do better than that. We really wanted zero, 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 just for the fact of the high insurance premiums that we pay to begin with. Yeah, I mean, the staffing situation in particular has been an issue for you all, but also for nurses, you know, at facilities across the state, across the country. What has that been like? And give us a sense of what you all are up against. Well, I think, again, because of the nursing shortage, it is, um, you know, it's harming itself with the nursing shortage. But I, I think in general, with the replacement workers that they have in there now, they are giving them better staffing guidelines than we could ever have, maybe because they're paying high dollars for these people to come in. But New York just, uh, and New York just approved another big contract yesterday. If they can do it, like I say, we've tried for 20 years to get this through the state 
and we're hitting roadblocks after roadblocks after roadblocks. I think if the state took a little initiative and if the hospitals work with them, we could probably get this passed and everybody would have the ratios. Meaning, would you like to see the governor's office step in here? I absolutely would, yes, I Where would. Where does that stand? Is that even on the table? Um, it is not to my knowledge. They have not, um, they may have been in touch with the USW headquarters, but not locally with us, they have not. I mean, at this point, you all are on day five. We're talking about um, a massive hospital system here in the state. Uh, how long do you foresee this going? How long do you all plan on staying on the picket lines? That's really up to the hospital. We're ready, willing, and able to sit down to get our workers back to work and to get our nurses back to the hospital that we built. I mean, what type of scenario does that create for your nurses? Obviously, they have mortgages, rent to pay, bills to pay, um, if we are, in fact, looking at a protracted strike. Well, the one good thing, we'll get unemployment. It, it doesn't pay the salaries that we, we make as nurses. Um, the USW has a strike in fund defense. And I think, actually, some nurses are probably going to start looking for other jobs because you know, like I say, the emails we're getting every day is just like, we love our replacement workers. That's what they're saying. And just the respect. And like I say, after 28 years, it's hard pressed to even want to continue my employment there. I will continue, but not with the press releases that are going out that are saying that we're just greedy individuals. Judy Dinella is the president of the United Steelworkers Local 4-200 on the situation there with Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital. Judy, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. In our Spotlight on Business report, the days of the Jersey Shore TV series and binge drinking on the boardwalk are over in Seaside Heights, where the mayor is on a mission to rebrand the shore town as a family-friendly destination, starting with converting the sites of former beachfront bars and nightclubs, focusing on quality of life issues, and even boosting the age requirement to get a short-term rental. Melissa Rose Cooper has the story. We make uh, the boardwalk a part of our everyday walk and we come and get drinks, we get our pliables, we see entertainment, it's great. Kimberly Lally and her husband love visiting Seaside Heights. For years, the Jersey Shore town has been a central part of their summer vacations. Every summer and every day that we can, we're pretty much regulars. You see the same people, which is really nice too, but then you also get to see like fit families coming. It's nice, we like it. The kind of family-friendly atmosphere Mayor Tony Vaz enjoys seeing, but he says years of rowdy behavior by teens and young adults has given the area a bad reputation. Drinking in public, underage drinking, and so forth. It was affecting everyone because people that came down for the summer kind of were frightened that they didn't know what the, was going to happen at night or when it got darker. They were f fearful of something happened to them, injuries or attacks or verbal. So Vaz is working to boost Seaside Heights as a welcoming family destination. Plans are in motion to redevelop this area along the boulevard where three former nightclubs once stood into a thriving mixed-use development complete with apartments, shops, and restaurants. The town is also implementing new guidelines to curb disorderly conduct. We changed the rental rules uh, certain times of the year with the exceptions of April to June 30th. You must be 21 years of age to rent in that period that I just mentioned. Otherwise, it's 18, but we've worked with our uh, landlords, our motel owners, and we're gearing all our rentals to basically families. We bring kids down, they come down, but they're gonna learn that they're not, this isn't the seaside of half a dozen years ago. It's a different community. We're not gonna tolerate at two o'clock in the morning beer parties. Those days are over. Seaside has always gotten a bad rap for some reason, but this is a great place to come to. I've been to every boardwalk in New Jersey, and this boardwalk is very family friendly. There's a lot to do for families. The stores are very cleaned up and nice. Peter La Rosa has been managing his store on the Seaside Boardwalk for 30 years. He says even though some people complain about there being disruptions, it doesn't take away from the town's beauty. There's bad apples in every bunch. You know, I mean, you can't go to every town and say, you know, there's sometimes there's a bad Bad seed. And, if, and if one bad bunch comes, it doesn't mean that the whole town is not family friendly. Jenny Larson has been coming here since she and her husband were in their 20s dating. Two kids later, she says their visit is always fun for everyone. I have not seen any issues. I know that a lot of people say in the daytime, you know, it's very more family oriented, but I don't think there's anything wrong with a little nightlife. So, you know, as long as everyone's safe and having fun, I think it's great. Yes, you could have a drink. You can dance. We, we're all for this. We want you to come down. 
Bring your partner, your spouse, your friends. Dance, drink. But understand, we don't want fights. This is not a nightclub atmosphere. Dance, have fun. That's what you're here for. And the mayor says the town has already seen positive changes since the age for short-term rentals was raised. He hopes redeveloping the area will be the next steps in making Seaside Heights enjoyable for everybody. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Melissa Rose Cooper. On Wall Street, U.S. bank stocks dropped today after Moody's rating company downgraded 10 lenders. Here's how the markets closed. A Trenton native is paving the path for low-income families to find their way to homeownership, creating a program that helps residents redevelop abandoned properties, helping to build up the capital city using what it already has rather than tear it down. Senior correspondent Joanna Gagas reports as part of our ongoing series, Chasing the Dream, focusing on poverty, justice, and economic opportunity. I didn't want to spend a penny more renting. I wanted to own something, and I wanted to leave something behind to my children and my family. Vanessa Sullivan is now officially a Trenton homeowner. The dilapidated building behind her just purchased through the New Beginnings housing program that Sullivan herself helped the city of Trenton launch. This used to be my uh, grandmother's house, so I played in this house as a girl, and I know it's a uh, potential. And I'm very excited. Um, I have my beautiful garden. The idea came from Sullivan's persistent requests that the town council and mayor help her turn the abandoned property into one she could redevelop. Mayor Reed Gassiora found a way to make it work. What we used is a uh, dried up fund uh, from regional contribution uh, agreements that towns that didn't want to do affordable housing, they would give money to the urban areas. We're utilizing those LAPS funds for this purpose, to rehabilitate Vanessa's home and then give it to, to her. Gus Yora says the program is different from others that have failed in the past because this is no handout. Homeowners like Vanessa have to have skin in the game. She had to demonstrate that she had financial literacy, that she could pay taxes, that she could pay utilities. How I was able to have those funds was I used my entire uh, income tax refund to purchase uh, the home and my legal fees, which came to a total of $5,000. The program is specifically for people like myself that are working and are making between 30 to 35,000 a year. With somewhere near a thousand abandoned properties around this city, the mayor is exploring ways to really expand this program using a combination of government funding as well as some outside funding sources. We're starting out small. We're, we're going to utilize the RCA funds until they dry up. And then we're going to work with other nonprofits and try to expand the program and raise money in the future. And while the city's still figuring out what that growth will look like, Sullivan has a clear goal. I hope to get 20 more families in homes within the next three years. There's a benefit to Trenton for expanding this program. Abandoned properties that attract crime will now stabilize housing for Trenton residents and generate tax revenue for the city. It's a, a couple of thousand dollars a year and that Vanessa here on out will have to pay for those property taxes. Her mom, who lives just across this garden that Vanessa now owns as part of the sale, has no doubt her daughter will be a success. She's still going to keep going. She ain't quit yet. She's going further and forward. Nah, I'm there for her. This moment of returning what was once her grandmother's home to the next generation, an emotional one for both mom and daughter. If y'all only knew all the memories we had in there, and we're going to have more now, you know, because the family's gotten bigger and it's growing. So I'm very proud of my daughter. And to help other families achieve the same dream of home ownership, Sullivan plans to turn her front room into a storefront. We have meetings here, community meetings, and also let this be the headquarters for New Beginnings. So if any family or anybody has any questions that they want to ask me about the process, I'm, I'm very open to sharing my experience. And in partnership with the Princeton Justice Initiative, the next five families that apply for home ownership will receive free legal services, proving it takes a village to create one. In Trenton, I'm Joanna Gagas, NJ Spotlight News.
Well, finally tonight, a tribute to the late Lieutenant Governor Sheila Oliver. The state is commissioning portrait paintings of both Oliver and former Lieutenant Governor Kim Guadano, the first to hold the position in New Jersey history. According to Governor Murphy's office, the portraits will be displayed at the State House in Trenton when they're complete. Now, unlike former governors, the fairly new role of Lieutenant Governor hasn't been recognized with official paintings. Murphy said in a statement, it's time to address address this shortcoming and set a new standard to commemorate their time in public service, calling the position pivotal to gubernatorial administrations. Oliver died one week ago while still in office after being hospitalized for undisclosed medical conditions. Her body will lie in state in the State House Rotunda Thursday and then at the Essex County Courthouse in Newark on Friday. Civil rights leader Reverend Al Sharpton will deliver the eulogy at Oliver's funeral Saturday morning. That's going to do it for us tonight, but a reminder to download the NJ Spotlight News podcast so you can listen anytime. I'm Brianna Venozzi for the entire NJ Spotlight News team. Thanks for being with us. Have a great evening. We'll see you here tomorrow. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. New Jersey Realtors, the voice for real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com and by the PSEG Foundation. Major funding for Chasing the Dream is provided by the JPB Foundation with additional funding from the Peter G. Peterson and Joan Gans Cooney Fund. Have some water. Look at these kids. How are you? What do you see? I see myself. I became an ESL teacher to give my students what I wanted when I came to this country. The opportunity to learn, to dream, to achieve, a chance to belong and to be an American. My name is Julia Toriani Crompton and I'm proud to be an NJEA member.